Hey, Feminist Frequency Radio regulars and irregulars. We are almost at the end of our May campaign fundraising drive, and we need your help to push us over the top. We're just about $5,000 away from our $35,000 goal, and we know we can get there by the end of the month if you help. Can you kick in $1, $5, maybe 10 bucks to help us reach our fundraising goal? All of the work you support contributes to the production of fresh, intelligent, thought-provoking media criticism, and that's being taken into classrooms, workshops, and conferences around the world. Help us make the next generation more media literate and more critically aware of the world around them. Now, more than ever, we could use your support. Head to FeministFrequency.com slash donate and be a part of the movement to make the media you want to see. And now, on with the show. Hey everybody, it's Ebony, just letting you know that the episode that you are about to hear kind of makes it sound like my special guest was in a wind tunnel that was about to get turned on. That is not the case. I do not have our special guest locked in a secret underground bunker, no matter what they say. So we've tried to clean up the audio as best we could. We think it's clear. We think that you're still going to be able to enjoy the show, but just know that the sound quality is going to be a little bit different from the, uh, the normal, smooth, seamless, just, you know, diamond hard audio deliciousness that our wonder producer Phil gives you every week. Stick with it. We think you'll enjoy the show anyway. All right. On with today's episode. Hey everybody, welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is episode number 28. You are not going to believe this. <laughs> and you're definitely not going to like it, but Anita left me in charge. She left me uh, alone in the studio to handle this week's episode. So if there's one week that you're going to give a miss, this would be the week to do it. I'm your babysitter. Uh, I'm the school bus driver. I am your parole officer. I am the one in charge. Uh, I'm also the smooth operator because Anita will be back in the country in a couple of weeks. And so next week, who knows what I have in store for you. I bet Carolyn will be back, though, so you can breathe a huge sigh of relief. Uh, And actually, as long as you're breathing that huge sigh of relief, I want you to be very comforted by the fact that it's not just me on the show today. I have a very, very, very special guest. This is an old and dear friend friend of mine. We tunneled out of Shawshank together decades ago uh, and have created new lives. Wouldn't you say that, Julie, that, you know, uh, as far as rehabilitation goes, we're well on our way to becoming whole people, uh, very mature adults? Uh, I I would definitely say so. Uh, So I have with me on the line a woman I'm very excited to, to introduce you to, comedian, writer, um, I believe she said she's recently getting work as a um, newspaper delivery person, um, <laughs> amateur chicken wrangler. Uh, That's sur- how I bring you the news. Yeah, a uh, survey taker, um, you know, uh, bootleg Chanel bag manufacturer, and wiener dog whisperer, Julie DeGroat, known to me and fans all over the world as Bernadette. Bernadette, how are you doing? I'm fantastic. Summer. Summer? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I gave you that incredibly fulsome um, introduction, and then you're just going to give me a one-word response? Is that the tenor of the show? It's it's just trying to be brief. Oh, no. Be brief. Don't be brief. Be okay. be be loud and um, yeah. Don't don't let me be out here on my own. I'm always the one that's cutting up on the show. Do me a favor and also just throw a little craziness into the mix this week. Help okay. me, okay? That's very easy. Right on. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love, or alternatively, we are the feminist killjoys coming for your media, depending on your perspective. In today's show, Julie and I are going to be talking about whatever I can get her to talk about, which will basically be Minnesota politics, how to properly bake a ham, and the proper time of day to start baking a ham. Also, I want her to talk about being the funniest person I know. Because this woman has made me pee my pants no less than three times as an adult. As an adult. We might <laughs> also... T- was... What? You want to you take issue? Was it before issue? or after the ham? Sometimes. 
when I'm really into the ham that's coming out of an oven, I lose bladder control. It happens. Uh, <laughs> I understand. Yeah. Uh, Julie and I might also touch on some media related stuff. In fact, we almost certainly will, because that is the actual stated mission of Feminist Frequency Radio. Uh, one of the things that she's going to walk us through is protest music, how it relates to the way we understand American history and global history and global politics. And, um, you know, what counts as, as protest music. So I'm super excited about when we get to that portion of the program. If we have time, Julie and I will both finish the show by both sharing a little something in What's Your Freak Out, which used to be called What's Your Deal, which is an objectively better name. Don't at me. I don't care. Uh, so if we don't get to that segment now that it doesn't have my title, I really don't care. It's immaterial <laughs> to me. And, and that's just how I roll. True to form. Yes, yeah, right, baby. Exclusively for our fantastic drip backers, this week's bonus is going to be another surprise, just like last week's was a surprise when I surprised uh, Anita by letting her know that even though I vowed to her that I would never watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer, I did in fact watch some episodes of Buffy. Um, she lost her mind with joy. Um, she was so incredibly moved. And so this week is, is going to be another uh, special treat. And I'm hoping that I might be able to get Carolyn on the line to share some highlights from her recent trip to Copenhagen and the Nordic Games Fest. But no matter what we do for Ooh, the bonus, exciting. I know it's going to be very exciting. So tune in for that on Drip. What is Drip, you ask? Well, it is a subscription-based membership platform, and your generous support is what helps us keep making this podcast. If you want access to special perks and exclusive backer rewards, join our podcast community at d.rip slash femfreak. Now, on with the show. Julie, how are you? Yes. I'm great. It, I'm it, so happy that you asked me to do this. I'm so happy you were available to do this. So just a little history here. Julie and I have known each other for like, oh, God, roughly four decades. Um, 20 years, have, actually. Yeah. And it's 20 years this fall. For real. Like, did you yeah, know that? Yeah, 1998. Damn. I haven't really told the people how old I am. Like, I try and, you know, keep it fuzzy just because, you know, I'm smooth like that. Although, really, well, if you do we, the, met, we met when we were eight years old. So. Yeah. You know, at, uh, in our Girl Scout troop, which we completed a coup for and, and took over and turned into a biker gang at the sweet well, age. Well, the knife day. work was vital. Listen, you, you learn, uh, you learn early on the streets. But no, Julie and I have known each other forever. We met in Minneapolis, um, at a coffee shop in South Minneapolis and have been just stupidly close friends since then. She's someone that, like she just has the the sweetest heart, but also is, you know, as I said at the top of the show, one of the funniest people I know. And that's no pressure, Julie. Like, feel free to be completely serious on this podcast. If you don't deliver some of your patented humor, you know, these people are strangers. They don't know you. They don't they don't get to have what I have as your good friend. <laughs> So I'm not right. I'm not worried about it. Um, but yeah, Julie, it's comedy us. monogamy with you, with, well, at least for me. Oh, man, that makes me sound like I might be. You know what? You're right. I am selfish. We'll talk about that later in, in couples therapy. It's OK. Julie, tell us, tell the people a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm uh, I'm a Gemini and I probably have ADD. I'm interested in a lot of different things, which is why Ebony makes the perfect friend for me. Because Ebony knows everything and knows a little bit a, a little bit about everything. So And if I don't uh, know, I, I will about lie about it and fake it. You know? I think that's on honestly one of my best qualities is that I want people to feel supported. So if they're interested in something, I will make up a fact just to keep the conversation going. Is that helpful? I don't know if it's helpful. Well you always have an excellent question. That's part of what works. You always nice. ask it really I don't know if you're interested all the time, but it always seems like it. I typically am interested because when you say that you're interested in a lot of different things and you've got your finger in a lot of different pies, hey, yo, I, <laughs> <laughs> what's great about that is that you aren't just interested in like, I mean, I don't even know. Now, if I say something and say, oh, that would be a boring thing to be interested in, then, you know, a Folks are going to come out of the woodwork and be like, it's actually a very interesting topic. But I mean, right. in terms of like, you know, the the things you find to obsess over are just straight up banana soup. It's never anything that um, that anyone would 
would pick out, you know, for you, like, of what you're like a walking kind of Wikipedia rabbit hole about the weirdest shit. And I'm hoping that we're going to get into some of it, even if we only wind up talking about your brief love affair with Owen Wilson. Oh, God. That ended badly. Well, it was never going to go anywhere. No. It's just one of those things you're like, well, I'll try it. I'll try it for now. We'll see what happens. And then you just really know. If you get asked that question in the beginning, it's over with. Part of the problem, I think, is that you were trying to do that, you know, um, call a polyamorous thing with Owen and Luke at the same time. And I just think they're such competitive brothers. Well, neither one of them were into it. Yeah. Neither one. <laughs> well, also, you can't fake the funk. You can't fake the love. So, yeah, we'll we'll talk about that in the in the main body of the show, because I really want to get into um, your bootleg celebrity crushes. Because, again, my bootleg celebrity crush. There's always one. Exactly. There's always one. And it's never the person that you think. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit of pop culture news, a little bit of political news. Um, so just, you know, as a reminder to folks, I'm terrible at podcast hosting, which is why Anita doesn't let me have control of the mic very often. Um, this is our second time recording um, the intro to the show. The first time um, I mentioned that when it's left up to me, uh, and I have to talk about pop culture news, I will always choose the most ridiculous niche shit to talk about because basically I get 97% of my information from Twitter. And so if it's not being talked about in my specific Twitter timeline, I either don't know about it or don't care about it. Or just don't have time. Well, there's that too. There's only 24 hours in the day and I'm old. So once the Metamucil hits, I got shit to do, literally. So it left to my own devices, I probably would spend this entire episode talking about Kanye West, Kim Kardashian, Donda's house, and just the kind of like social media blow up that happened over the weekend. Are you aware of this conversation that's been happening, Julie? I am not. And not because I don't want to, not, not because I don't want to be, but yeah, yeah I was up, up, up in uh, Northern Minnesota on the Canadian border. There's not much technology there. Frostbite Falls. International Falls. Frostbite Falls. That's right. Julie was blown away by the fact that I told her I was literally just rewatching some Rocky and Bullwinkle over the past couple of days. It's a holiday weekend. I don't know what you want from me, people. There's very little, like... Why would that be on? Where would it be available for people? YouTube. Like, I searched this out. This was not something that just happened to be on TV. Like, I, del- I typed it in with my own sausage fingers into the YouTube search bar. I wanted to see some Rocky and Bullwinkle. I'm very interested Did in- Did you hold the ham sandwich to mouth? Girl, bye. All right, so pop culture news, Kanye West, Kim Kardashian, Donda's house. So if you know anything about Kanye West, you'll know how incredibly close and devoted he was to his mother, Dr. Donda West, who was just really a preeminent educator in the Chicago area, uh, educator and activist, and just so committed to helping the youth of Chicago. After um, Dr. West died... Kanye and Rhymefest um, started a foundation that they called Donda's House in his mother's honor um, to help uh, the youth of Chicago with lots of things, um, arts education, you know, housing, schooling, etc. The word on the street has been that despite Kanye constantly throwing out his, you know, shy bona fides, he hasn't actually been that involved in the running of Donda's House. And I mean, like hands on running or financial support. So some stuff kicked off this weekend when Rhyme Fest, who actually co-wrote some of Kanye's biggest songs and who, as I said, helped found this organization with Kanye, Donda's House, you know, took to Twitter to be like, you know, what's what's real? You know, like Kanye, you've been saying basically like, fuck the youth of Chicago You started this foundation with your mom's name. Why aren't you actually here out in the streets helping us? Kim Kardashian, you know, took herself to Twitter to support her man, you know, and basically say, we're going to take the foundation away from you and let my kids run it. Girl, bye. You know, I I got very little time for people who want to kick off and talk loud on social media, but who can't back it up. Um, But the whole thing just sounds shady and foul. There are so many ways that this could have been addressed if Kanye really felt that there were troubles with the running of uh, Donda's house as uh, you know as a charity as a not-for-profit educational organization 
the thing's been in existence since 2013. Over the past five years, he could have stepped in. So to step in in the shady way that he kind of has been doing now, while at the same time, toting water for Trump, like really, at this point, take your MAGA ass somewhere. I hope his album goes straight aluminum foil. I hope that shit flops. So that's my pop culture news. Um, But taking it into more serious news, I also want to mention two wonderful things that happened in the world. Like, it's not all just, you know, trash people um, hitting that 140 character limit. Number one, Stacey Abrams. So Stacey Abrams, a dynamic, brilliant black woman, became Georgia's Democratic candidate for governor. She won more than 75 percent of the vote and... um, she becomes she has become the first black woman to be nominated um uh, i believe this is accurate the first black woman to be nominated by a major political party for governor of any state ever um so i encourage so people great. yeah i encourage people to really you know check out stacy abrams and her history her platforms what she stands for her personal background i just think you know we are <sighs> we are so accustomed in this country because of our particular puritanical um, colonialist past to, you know, consciously or unconsciously choose the same sorts of leaders um, time after time and then wonder why we're getting the same results. So I'm incredibly excited um, for Stacey Abrams to be in the place that she's in. It's going to be a very, very ugly race against her Republican opponent. And so I en- I encourage people to stay informed because if you think things have been, you know, ugly heretofore um, with these, these various, you know, Uh, state races before we get into, you know, the 2018 uh, midterms. I really encourage you to see how people are going to show their ass um, at the during this governor's race, because like they're just going to take the lid off, you know, the racist 40. It's going to be on and popping down there. And it is imperative that we stay aware. And it's going to be everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it is going to be everywhere. Power does not give itself up willingly. We're going to have to fight. The next thing is. Ireland. Uh, I want to shout out the Irish voters, many who flew in, you know, uh, from places outside of Ireland who came home to vote. That was the hashtag home to vote. Uh, They went to the ballot box on Friday to vote in a historic referendum to repeal the eighth constitutional amendment. The eighth constitutional amendment of the Irish constitution denies women the right to abort pregnancies, except in the case where the pregnant person's life is in danger. So the yes campaign which again, repeals that amendment, works to repeal that amendment overwhelmingly uh, won the day with over 75% of the vote. One of the things that, you know, Julie and I were talking the first time we recorded this intro was about how I was so disheartened and and horrified, really, by the really specifically um, American tenor of the kind of evangelical arguments against um, the repeal. And so if you, we'll, we'll put some links up to these things, but, but there are some really gross advertisements that were supporting the amendment, which again, bans abortion, um, which really trafficked in and played on these really gross gender essentialist notions of like men being the protectors of the family and by extension being the, um, the final arbiters of what a woman can do with her body. And so you have men in the accoutrements, like in the trappings of authority. So like firemen, law enforcement officers, and the, the wording says things like men, you know, it's your duty to save the family or men, you must protect children, you know? Um, How about this so one? the way they do this one, men, you must retain your sperm. Oh yeah, because what what were you saying that there was a um it's the <laughs> I can't even remember. It was something right. about like the sperm preservation society or something. Yeah, well no, the, well that's the that's the local unit. The thing is there was when you mentioned this fireman, I was imagining them with this big fire hose of sperm and just and the, the law and order sh- the law and order offshoot sperm preservation unit to be honest i don't think that would be out of line with the direction the current franchise has taken people who listen to this show in fact people who meet me 
just on the street, because I'll talk about it at a moment's notice, know how obsessed I am with crime dramas and crime TV. And so, listen, I will take a smooth lawn order nap any time of the day and just marathon that shit. Um, and I say that knowing that it's basically copaganda, right? Like, it's all about getting us comfortable with oh, that's and a desirous good of... Oh, yeah, I didn't I didn't make that up. Shout out to whoever, you know, created that word. Um, it was actually something that a term that people were using once there was all this hubbub about Brooklyn Nine-Nine um, getting canceled. And they were like, yeah, the show is funny as hell and it's got heart. And, you know, uh, we love the way that the show brings together all of these diverse people. But let's not forget that any show with this like kind of fundamental structure is ultimately propaganda. You know, it's about making us comfortable with certain surveillance and the police state, you know, like, let's be real. So well, it's a constant humanizing of the completely different reality that we see in the news. Yeah, like yeah. The, re- the reality is that our current police state has not always existed, nor has it always existed in the form in which it currently operates. And yet, you would not know that from the way we have um, surrendered to the belief that it is natural, that it is just, and that it is right. And so I say this as a person who, as soon as I'm done with this podcast, I will probably go tune in some version of Law & Order, which is on every hour of the day on some channel, while at the same time recognizing, like, I'm falling for the okie doke myself. I'm, I'm, I'm complicit in this, y'all. I get it. I understand. But, you know. Well, my mom is probably watching the 24 hour forensic vials channel right now yo one day there we need to have a conversation whether it's you and me julie me and anita and carolyn somebody it, it Maybe me writing on the website about not just crime dramas, because we know that of any given show that's going to be on any network, there's a good chance it's going to have something to do with the um, either the commission of a crime or the solving of said crime, right? Oh, the uh, completely unrealistic wrapping up of the whole story. Those Forensic Files episodes are like 26 minutes or something. It's crazy. It's always the husband. Well, that's true. I mean, that's real, though, right? Like. Come on. Come on. But no, like, so we have like the fictive versions of it. Um, you know, like your lawn orders, your blue bloods, your, you know, whatever. But then you also have these shows like, or channels like the ID channel or discovery or whatever. And overwhelmingly huge parts of their programming are about these like true crime things and like true crime podcasts. We are obsessed with the notion of getting justice. In this country, while at the same time being completely unwilling to do the work in reality. It's amazing well, to me. If the media that was available, the crime media <laughs> that's available, if they would tell you at the end, hey, if you see a situation like this, you can get involved with this organization and maybe we can yeah. stop this from happening. But they're not interested in putting themselves out of business. No, well, they are. But also there no one is really well, I shouldn't say no one, but few people are actually interested in unpacking exactly what leads to uh, some of these crimes. Right. So the minute you mention a term like rape culture, you know, people don't want to actually have the conversation um, that it takes and do the work that it takes to actually dismantle rape culture such that sexual assault does not occur, you know, Um you know, we want to talk about like, you know, property theft and, you know, uh, embezzling, whatever. People rarely want to do the actual hard work of unpacking why these things occur. Well, right. Does anybody on when they do those like to catch a predator things, does anybody ever ask the guy, the predator, uh, why he does what he does or why he's there? Except to give beer to a minor. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly, I, I have no idea because that show makes me so incredibly uncomfortable. Just the whole idea of the show, you know, um, being being uh, sort of forced to face the abuse and the exploitation of children in that way um, for what is essentially entertainment. Um, just makes me so wildly uncomfortable. I've never actually watched that show. I've seen all the memes, all the, you know, uh, what's his name, memes for To Catch a Predator, but I, I, I can't watch it. But yeah, I mean, we're not, we're not interested in actually doing the work to, um, to, to help children in our daily lives, but we will watch these shows where, you know, like TV producers pretend to be a teenager and then, you know, 
trap some perver. What we're gone way off the rails, way Sorry. off the rails. You yeah. don't apologize. It was my fault. I was the person steering this ship, and we have run aground. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw you into a lifeboat, and we're gonna try and paddle uh, to better shores. Let's move into the main round table. Julie, are you ready to just chop it up? precisely the way that we have been for the past 15 minutes, but about different topics. Are you ready? Go. Oh. I assume you're ready. Okay. I have several things bullet pointed here that I would like you to speak on. Find Finding your purpose later in life. As I mentioned at the top of the show, you and I are both roughly 87 years old. Neither one of us knew what we wanted to do with our lives until about three weeks ago. But I think now that we've started this combination of wiener dog farm slash apple ranch, things are really going to take off for us. So I want to talk about that. It's just just the same idea. It's just later in life. Yeah, but I think there's... (laughs) Part of the reason why I need to take enforced social media breaks <laughs> so often is because it seems like everybody's grinding, right? It's not just student athletes. It's like, yo, go out and get it. Work every day. Write every day. Paint. Make music. You know, if you're not creating, you're not living, you know, like ball hard, whatever. It is overwhelming it is anxiety producing and so you know like god bless him i just rewatched black panther with my family the other night ryan coogler is a genius dude's a genius right he's 32 years old he just turned 32 what What's up with donald that made glover? that just made me speaking of donald glover i posted this on twitter the other day basically this entire podcast is me just recapping my twitter timeline get into it my father who was almost 70 years old, showed me a picture of him when he was about 20. He's convinced he looks like Daniel Glover. And I was like, do you mean Donald Glover or do you mean Danny Glover? He didn't know. So just take that however you want. So perfect. Take that however so perfect. <laughs> Maybe he meant both. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so I think, you know, there's in a in a world in which so many more opportunities are available for so many more people, we are still oppressed by the notion that if you don't do things by the time you're 25, you know, 30, that your life is over. You know, if you don't have a house by a certain point, you're a failure. If you don't have, you know, a job that pays you six figures by a certain point in your life, um, you're a failure. If you, you know, have no ability to even look towards, you know, retirement, you know, you're a failure. And so I think there's something really comforting about hearing from people. I mean, I'm not saying it needs to be us, but comforting from hearing from people who are doing creative things um at a slow pace (laughs) yeah but who are just like yo hey i want to hear from the people with all the unfinished projects thank you you know who've got like a a a craft closet full of shit you picked up at michael's (laughs) you know that's that's all open like you can't even return it to the store eight years ago yeah, you know, like ideas that you thought I could have put this up on Etsy, make a billion dollars. Turns out you don't even know how to embroider. No one wants your cross stitch. But, you know, it turns out everybody else is already doing it. Exactly. So that's that's one. Talking about finding your purpose later in life. Two, I want to hear you expand on your favorite topic. Maybe not your f- favorite topic, but your second or third favorite topic, the Pope. Doesn't matter who the Pope is. The Pope is someone that I feel you think about at least seven times a day. So I definitely want to hear you talk about that. You know, it's Uh, not true. It's not true. I don't think about the Pope much anymore. Is it because of this particular Pope? Yeah, I'm not so worried about the Pope. (laughs) I'm not so worried about this one. I'm not so worried about any of them, really. Which Pope did you find yourself thinking the most about? Pope Benedict, for yeah. sure. Yeah, it was because you're a huge yeah. Star Wars fan, and he looked like Emperor Palpatine. He, <sighs> That's a nerd reference that I'm just going to keep it moving. I'm not even going to bother yeah. unpacking yeah. that. But now that he's safely ensconced in a you know little gay getaway cottage within the walled city of the Vatican, you know, whatever. Uh-huh. Okay, that's fine. Cool. Uh, so we can talk about the Pope or not talk about the Pope. Uh, we can also talk about the Sopranos. We could also talk about The Sopranos. How about that? You and I spent many hours talking about and watching The Sopranos, um, eating 
veritable buffets of Italian food while watching The Sopranos. I feel like there could be um, a really fruitful discussion there. When was the last time you watched an episode? Probably like 10 years ago? Um, I think it was, I actually tried to watch the last few seasons um, a couple years ago. My wife is a very big TV fan, tries to get me involved all the time, but I don't really buy it. Most of the time, like, you yeah, say it like uh, you say it like it's a scam, so like she's trying to trick you. What do you mean you're not buying? Hey, it, it is a scam. That's, that's how I feel about most movies. You know, I always leave feeling, oh, why did you need my time? And I know you needed my money, but why did I give it to you? <laughs> Where did what? What was the most recent movie you saw that you thought that? Vanilla Sky, Gone with the Wind. No, I haven't. I haven't been to a movie in a theater in years. That's, I'm just going to be honest. So wait, so are you crab caking? Are you crab caking about movies having not even seen a movie recently? Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. I'm qualified to do that. I Well, I take care of my mom. You know, I take care of my, my mom who's elderly and that's, you know, finding your purpose late in life. But, uh, you know, it, it, it leads to a different sort of myopia. So... You know, when you have a housebound adult, you tend to sample things even more briefly than we all do now. So, well, and as you said, there are only so many hours in the day, and th- that's real. We, it's impossible for us to keep up with everything, despite the constant clamor um, to do so, and despite the you know sheer number of you know, things to keep up with. And then the economy that has sprung from that, whereby people endlessly talk about, and I I recognize the very meta nature of this conversation, because I'm about to bemoan, you know, pop culture criticism that endlessly recycles, you know, talking about these things. Um, But it's impossible to keep up with all of these things. This is why I say, you know, on every episode of the podcast, if it were not for Anita and Carolyn making me watch and listen to certain things, I simply would not choose to do it because there's only so many hours in the day. I'm watching as much crime drama as I can on any given day. And the rest of the time, I'm either apparently watching Rocky and Bullwinkle or Doctor Who like you know at this point I'm looking purely for like media comfort food so it's good that I'm forced to get out of my bubble every so often what's interesting is that comfort media for you is crime oh yeah I understand but you know I've I've talked about this on the show before it's something that I need to get into with my therapist for many more sessions, but a lot of it had to do with the way that um, that I processed my mother's death. Um, a lot of it has to do with the way I try and come to terms with the horror that exists around me, you know, in the world. Like, I think we're all kind of staring this in the face. And so having the neat, tidy resolution that crime drama offers is very satisfying. It is a it is a it is a lie on its face. It is, you know, it is a placebo. It is not actually medicine in any way, but it does make me feel better. It's, you know, it's media Ativan in a way. Um, well, nobody has time for all the uh, painful uncertainty. Yeah, exactly. You know, so 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 that's that's where I am. Um, but no, for real. So I, I throw out these like bullshit topics. Um, but but in reality, I brought you on the show because I love to hear you expound upon. So Julie and I talk very frequently and we used to write comedy together. We've done other sorts of, of writing together. Um, but the thing that I cherish most about my time with her is just getting on the phone and listening to you talk, Julie, about something that, you know, it's like connections that you're making. Um, because I think you just have a really interesting way of putting stuff together. So I know, I know that I'm putting you on the spot, but it's too late. You already agreed to, to be on the show and to talk with me about this. And so one of the things that you said, yeah, you know, I think I'd kind of like to talk about. And so I'd kind of want to chop it up with you about this is you wanted to talk about like our current, like a a retrospective of 1969, correct? 1968. 1968. So break it down for me exactly what interests you about this. Well, I grew up with a father who was a Vietnam veteran and a mom who was very interested in news and politics uh, all all throughout my life. And my dad was not a fan of the news, but he was a fan of history and about um, and of music. 
And his personal history inter- intersected with uh, music in the 60s, protest music and folk music. And my mother took part in some activism. They were both parts of, I guess what you'd say, movements, as much as you could have been part of a movement in Minnesota in the 1960s. So um, I think what's interesting now is starting in 2017, a lot of people, a lot of authors and, and artists and writers started doing sort of wrap-up 50-year retrospectives of 1968. 1968 was always a year that I was interested in because it had a lot of really interesting social and art and music movements colliding. And I always thought that it would be great to go back in time and be a stoned hippie. But there's much more to it, of course. I grew up to be a lesbian and came out. What do you mean grew up to be a lesbian? Well, you know what I mean. Publicly. I grew up through the 90s, grew up in a gay club, just like many other gays I know. And so a lot of what's interesting to me is about how the 1968 stuff meshes and becomes activism in the 90s, and then also sort of prepares us for what's going on now, I think. Because many times in my life I've been accused of being an alarmist, But I think being an alarmist prepares you for things. And I think that the more alarmist you are, the more attuned you are to little things changing around you and little cues you see. You you hear the dog whistles. You hear it all. You you notice it. Yeah, well, you know, like they say, like, you you aren't paranoid if people are actually out to get you. And I think it's it's you know abundantly clear that if you are queer, if you are a person of color, if you are trans, if you are poor, if you are you know an immigrant, like they are actually out to get us. This is not a joke. You know, we're not running around with our hair on fire here. You know, making up. We're not. We're not uh, behaving as if we're persecuted when that's not the case. We are in fact being persecuted. It's interesting because, well, I should say what's interesting, but. I was only able to watch two episodes of The Handmaid's Tale because it's my absolute nightmare. And I didn't read the book because I felt it was too far-fetched at the time, even though, uh, you know, authoritarianism and fascism and all of these things are very interesting to me. Interesting to me meaning they're instructive. One of the best ways... I'm interested in a lot of the self-care stuff because I'm really happy that's become something that people talk about. They talk about, you know, activism, burnout and self-care. One of the best ways we can take care of ourselves and feel better uh, and transport us to a better place or just hug ourselves is music. And no matter what happens, you should always have your emergency songs somewhere to listen to. And those are hot songs that make you feel happy and just like lift your soul, let you dance and just forget all of that other crap that's happening around us because we're all swirling the drain. So I think I grew up listening to a lot of protest music, a lot of folk music. My dad loved Judy Collins, loved Bob Dylan, was an enormous Dylan fan. Joan Baez, Phil Oaks, all of it. My mom was more like the Pete Seeger and uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary variety. But do you have any questions? No, I'm just into it. I'm just loving it. I also, I actually, I do have a question. So (laughs) people will not be surprised to learn uh, that, so Julie is white uh, and comes from small town Minnesota. So one of my questions is, excuse me, given, um, you know, when your parents, you know, were young, and the kind of music they were listening to. So you talk about them listening to, you know, s- folk music and stuff. Were they also listening to the really popular, like, black protest music of the day as well? Were you aware of them listening to... Um, because it's, 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 it's protest music, 
but of a different sort, right? So it may not. Oh yeah, it, it, it's the hoot nanny kind. <laughs> yeah, right. But you know, it's, I, I, I'm, obviously this is a you know kind of maybe cliche example, but you know, there's the Pete Seeger version of protest music, and then there's like you know Marvin Gaye, "What's Going On," which is not to say you could only listen to one, you know, um, or you know James Brown, "Say It Loud," "I'm Black and I'm Proud," like you know, it, I, I am interested in both what's being protested as well as who is doing the protesting in this music I'm listening to within the, within the child. Those, exactly. Um, it will, or, and that your parents were listening to, you know, because it's one thing to listen to it. Like say you're, you know, my dad, like I said, 70 years old, you know, comes out in New York, you know, black man listening to James Brown sing, say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud, you know, bumping that with his friends versus your father in small town, Minnesota, maybe listening to it, also loving it, but you know, not singing the words, you know, but still feeling like the radical, you know, kind of energy of a song like that. Well, you know, it's interesting because what it comes down to is the availability of media. I don't think they were exposed to James Brown other than any sort of superficial manner. I don't think that there were any radio stations or record stores where you could go in and be exposed to anything beyond what looked like you. Yeah. Unless you lived in Min- unless you lived in Minneapolis, I don't know. My parents didn't live in Minneapolis in pivotal times. <laughs> so um, I I know that my dad listened to my dad had sort of a gay sensibility. <laughs> he liked to listen to. Um, we had an enormous catalog of uh, black female singers. We had everything from the Supremes to Roberta Flack to everything on that spectrum that was either played as easy listening music or yeah. um yeah am gold but yeah so we had a lot of nancy wilson i think we had like 26 nancy wilson records and we had maybe eight supremes records we had a lot of stuff do you still have those all um, these? oh yeah i do i do i have them all all right a party at julie's house I'm not going to make anyone listen to the new Christy Minstrels, though. I won't allow you to. I will send that record through the window like a Frisbee. So I think, I mean, I've rambled a bit. No, that's good, because one one of the connections that I was really interested in was, you know, so you're, we're talking about this, you know, kind of retrospective. Um, and one of the things we've talked about on this show before is the kind of moment of never ending nostalgia um, that we seem to exist in as a culture, whereby every prior moment seems to exist simultaneously because we refuse to let it go in a way that never used to happen before because of like, you know, the, the, um, the ephemeral nature of human cultural production. So you could, you know, write a, uh, something on a scroll, but eventually that scroll is going to disintegrate and that, that piece of art or that, you know, prose or whatever, that poem is going to disappear. Now, um, we can access things from prior periods in ways that we did not uh, have the ability to do before. Yeah, to the technology is allowed us to regurgitate things that don't matter. Exactly. So I can I can access music from decades ago as easily as I can access something that came out this morning, you know, with with similar ease. And so there's a way in which we're existing in a modern era that is nevertheless simultaneously a past era. Sometimes this is wonderful. Sometimes we get things like Ready Player One, where we kind of, you know, refuse to let go of the 80s. Um, oh, God. But, you but, know I but I think... That. Yeah, but 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 this thing that we're talking about now, this kind of 50 year looking back at 1968 um, that you wanted to bring up, I found so interesting because we're talking about um, one of the ways that people both resist and communicate resistance and find the self care that allows them to find strength to keep resisting um, is through music. And there's a there's a long tradition of a protest music in this country going back to, you know, um, uh, slaves singing spirituals that help, you know, their, their fellow slaves escape to freedom. But I, I love when you talk about protest music that isn't 
necessarily considered protest music. So can you talk a little bit about you saying you're like, hey, I grew up into a lesbian. You know, I came up through the gay clubs of the 90s um, and listening to that music. And that helped you. I mean, I would say or would you say like maybe helped you discover who you are, what sort of person you are? Like, what are we talking about there? Affirmation. This is about affirmation. It's just hearing the little clue or the little code word or whatever that made you feel that somebody knew you existed somewhere and that it was okay to be that. And how huge that is. Well, it's it's life changing. Absolutely. And I think it's not one of perhaps um, it's not the kind of like bold um uh, statement that maybe we think of when we say protest music, but it absolutely is because when you're talking about a community that has been, that has had its very existence demonized or erased, the declaration, um, the affirmation, as you say, is is the, perhaps the boldest statement of all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, f- I find that fascinating. One of the things that um, a piece, and I'll try and find the a PDF version that I can share with people. <clears throat> excuse me, was an article written by a black queer cultural critic, I want to say in the early 2000s. And he talked about his experiences in gay clubs, in black gay clubs specifically, as a black queer man. And when this um, remixed version of a Shirley Caesar song would come on, and the way that it would light the club on fire. So for those of y'all that don't know, Shirley Caesar is an iconic, iconic gospel music artist um, from the black community. And, you know, if you if you know her today, but you're not in the church, you probably know her from the remix um, that would go around, you know, around Thanksgiving. I got beans, greens, potatoes, tomatoes. OK, so that's Shirley Caesar. Right. So Shirley Caesar does this song called Hold My Mule. And this this critic unpacks what it means to be in a room full of beautiful queer blackness celebrating through the remix of this gospel song and how that becomes protest music because of what they have done. So this genre of music that has traditionally not been celebratory of the queer experience that has in fact sought to 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 literally demonize it right has been literally remixed and and claimed and it becomes instead you know uh cricor, um you know this this call from the heart that says we are <laughs> we are here we love each other and that is beautiful and you know if you believe in a higher power that is god like i found god on the dance floor um with the with these other people i just i, I found that so wonderful and so expansive of this notion of of protest music and of resistance mhm well, I think that song that seems really t- cheesy, it's actually, it really boils it down. It's the perfect statement that last night a DJ saved my life. Mm-hmm. When we went to International Falls this weekend, uh, I was with my wife and she grew up there. And I grew up in southeastern Minnesota in the middle of nowhere. And both of us found our way to Minneapolis at the time, 1989-90. And the first time I walked into the saloon, I, I was just, I was amazed to be in a club, for one, and the music was as loud as we wanted it to be, and there were gay people everywhere, there were straight people everywhere, well, the colors, genders, everything. It was amazing. And one of the songs that I remember hearing the most, I most remember, um, was The Pressure, and it was remixed, and it was by Sounds of Blackness. Mm-hmm. And that song's an amazing song. Yeah. I mean, it predates the, um, you know, like Clavellis and Cole and Pride and the Name of Love, not the U2 one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I also read that article that you're mentioning. And what I love about it is that for that guy, what it did was it, it took it, it took that experience that's obviously important and, and emotional and historical for him, took it out, sampled it remixed it, gave it back to him, but in a venue that was him, not attached to all of the shit from the past or what people might think or what, or how much he loved being in church or singing and how he wasn't 
allowed to be part of that anymore. And, and I'm assuming some parts of his experience, but when you have something treasured, given back to you in a space that's yours and you didn't think you could get it back and enjoy it again, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. And I, I, the friends I have who are DJs are very crafty that way. And, uh, I love that in the nineties, we, we got a lot of messages of inspiration and assurance from our DJs. And I still look for that. There's a lot of really wonderful people out there working in music. It's not just all the EDM and the bass drop. And Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Like, do you keep up with a lot of, you know, current uh, music, whether that's, you know, club music, whether that's, you know, EDM, uh, whatever flavor of stuff? Like, do you keep up with a lot of new stuff? I don't keep up with a lot of new stuff. I Obviously, I notice when people re rehash or they try to, a la Kanye West, uh, you know, remix an old theme. But it, it never feels genuine when they do it. You know if it's real, because you react to it. Your soul soars. But, you know, and that goes... The, I'm going to mention Madonna, because I'm a huge Madonna fan. And she's problematic in a lot of ways, just as anybody is who's lived on the earth for 60 years. But she's pretty amazing. And... She continues to remix things. Some say, I'm not going to talk about the appropriation stuff because I don't feel like I'm really qualified to talk about that right now. I haven't thought about it too much. But also, I'm, I'm not an expert on appropriation. But one thing I know is that well, when... Well, that, pro- that is a problem because I did bring you on the show today to, uh, talk about to speak. It to speak as an expert on appropriation. So yeah, that we're going to have to vet our guests better. We're going to have to record another. We're going to have to do this again. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this again. This is golden. No, sorry. Continue your thought about Madonna. Um, Madonna, I saw her in her last two tours and she remixes. They do a video montage of a song from hard candy, which is an album that came out years ago. I think 10 years ago, me, um, it's called Get Stupid. And it's something she, when she worked with Pharrell. But they do a re, like a refreshed video montage every time she's on tour. And it's really intense. It's during a break when she's not even there. And the song is great because the message is really important. And it, it punches me in the gut every time I watch it because it's current news clips, old news clips. Uh, it's sort of video work they used to do at First Avenue when you used to go to Sunday Night Danceateria. There would be somebody on early in the night as a DJ trying to get political messages out and talking about sort of giving like a wake up call, like yeah. you're going to sleep, people. You need to wake up. And that's sort of what Donna tries to do. And I think sometimes I get lost in the coverage of her and how people react to her as a woman, an outspoken one. Uh, a sex object, how she looks, what she's saying instead of what she's doing. And that one, that's available on the YouTube. You can look up Madonna, get stupid. You watch the video and, and that's available on the, on the YouTubes. That's available on the internets. That one, that tube. Yeah. I don't know Uh what other tubes, but my all time favorite, my all time favorite, um, is there's band called Consolidated. I think they might be still together. But uh, 1991, there was a typical sort of chunky techno early uh, drum house song. And it was it's called This Is Fascism. And this was them reacting to like George Bush and the AIDS crisis and militarism issues of the 90s. That are still our issues. Uh, but this is fascism also available. There's an excellent video on YouTube that somebody put together with the art of Barbara Kruger. And it's it's chilling, but also very toe tappy. <laughs> um which which good protest music should be. Um but consolidated really lit it up for me. And there were lots of other house bands which is kind of a weird genre but 
who really got messages out there. You know, there was um, Crystal Method worked with Q-Tip, and they did that song. Uh, oh, God, I sound like an old woman. Did that song. What was that song called? Um, but I don't, it wasn't Avalanche. <laughs> I'm so sorry. We'll figure it out. We'll I'm figure it out and we'll, we'll put I'm it. Look at my notes. We'll put it on the playlist. And yeah, I'll we'll put right it on the one. playlist, which I am. I am so excited again to remind people we're going to we're going to put this Spotify playlist together. Um, we will put it in the show notes and I will make it collaborative. So I would love it if people who are listening to this, um, you know, add your favorite protest songs. Um, I would love it if you, you know, wanted to add some 90s house tracks, but it doesn't have to be 90s house. Let's let's get a protest music um, playlist together, uh, you know, as a as a team, Them Freak radio listeners, because I think, you know, what Julie is talking about here is something we don't we don't get a chance to talk about very much on uh, this podcast, which is music. But the way in which music is it's it's a genre, it's a medium unlike any other. And the way that it can move us and change us and fire us up and soothe us is absolutely unparalleled. And that's something that, you know, marginalized, oppressed communities know um, perhaps better than than any others. Um, so, so yeah, I, I encourage you to check out the playlist once it's once it's posted to add in uh, your own suggestions. Let's do this together. It's going to be, you know, and we'll play it at the Feminist Frequency uh, cookout, which we're going to hold at Anita's house. And she's finding that information out right now, just as I say it. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that people will experience if they listen to a really good playlist is that unlike the conversation, they will be inspired and maybe soothed and alternately riled up and they'll feel like they're being spoken to. And they're also going to get a bit great pep talk and like an emotional release. Something might make you angry or cry even, but you need that release. Whatever it is, whatever the emotional reaction is valuable and instructive. I think I'm excited. I'm excited. And for your sake, Julie, I'm going to um, I'm going to suspend my normal judgment about Madonna and listen to whatever Madonna tracks are on the playlist, because you know that I have, you know, as a as a black woman, I have kind of side eyed Madonna in the past. Um, it, it is and it's not even about some, you know, articulated position about appropriation necessarily. It's just, you know, I, I haven't been sure that. <sighs> The way she has, it, in the same way that, you know, um, black artists or brown artists will do something and get love within the community, but then a white artist will take it um, and then blow up and go worldwide. You know, I've I've often had troubles with that, specifically about like, you know, Madonna's, you know, use of uh, black and brown gay men um you know, during the Vogue era. But that's a discussion for another, another day, another episode. We will, we will come back to that uh, once we have Julie back on. But Julie, thank you for being on the show today. This has been absolutely wonderful. Um, but that wraps it up for today. So remember, Fem Freak Radio listeners, you too can join our podcast community and help us bring you this amuse bouche. Did I say? No, I didn't say that. Julie, my French is so terrible these days. Um, this amuse bouche of content every week at d.rip slash femfreak. If you are enjoying this show, please leave us a review on iTunes because it really helps spread the word. And, you know, tell your friends, too. You can check out all of our work and all of our other podcasts at FeministFrequency.com. So be sure to follow us on Twitter at FemFreak to stay up to date on all the news. We want to hear from you. So hit us up on Twitter at FemFreak. Let us know what you'd like to hear us talk about on Feminist Frequency Radio. You can find me, Ebony, on Twitter at I'm going to listen to Madonna and I'm not sure how I'm going to like it. Julie, are you on Twitter? I am on Twitter. Do you want to give people your Twitter handle? Oh, I think I don't even remember it. I'm sorry. I just I, uh. okay. You know what? Then you're not on Twitter. If you can't remember it, you're not on Twitter. You, you can find Anita at Anita Sarkeesian and Carolyn at Carolyn Michelle. Our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music. We will see y'all next week. Goodbye. <laughs>